church, everyone. We're so glad you're with us today. God's got done something new for you today. We join us in worship. These are the days that we pray for. A stirring of faith has begun. And I've seen so much, still I'm certain. The best is not yet come. Come on, let's sing this morning. Because Jesus, you're not done with me. You're doing a new thing. You're doing a new thing. And I've seen a wave of revival. Proceed. Justice and praise Where the young and the old run to Jesus Oh, and all the sins that held us back and led to ways Cause Jesus, you're not done with me You're doing a new thing Do you believe this this morning? Your love is never gonna give up. You never give up. You never give up on me. Your love is never gonna give up. You never give up. You never give up on me. Yeah, your love is never gonna give up. You never give up. You never give up on me.
Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you are watching online or you're with us here today in person, we are so happy to be with you, especially if it is your first time joining us today. Yeah, if it's your first time, we would love for you to fill out a connect card so we can stay connected with you throughout the week. You can do this by going onto the CLC app or visiting us if you're in person out at the Connect Center. We believe at Calgary Life Church that generosity is not just something that we do, but it is a part of who we are. And so as we prepare to give this morning, I want to encourage you, church, that your generosity is impacting people's lives, not just in our church, our city, but all across the world. So thank you for your giving. So you may have noticed we don't pass the offering containers anymore because of COVID restrictions. So here's some simple ways that you can give today to Calgary Life Church. A, you can go onto the Calgary Life Church app. B, visit us on website, calgarylifechurch.com slash give. Or if you are joining us here in person, head out into the hallway and visit us at the giving station. If you would like to connect with us after the service, you can join us by jumping into one of our Zoom lobbies. You can find the link on our website or in the chat. We hope to see you there. Next week, we are so excited to have Starting Point. If you are new to Calgary Life Church, or maybe you've just never gotten connected into our community, this is a perfect opportunity for you to come out, meet our pastors, meet the team, and learn where we are going as a church family. It is the best thing to do. Make sure you jump online to register or visit us out at the Connect Center. Our online presence is growing internationally, which means that we need more online moderators that don't speak just English. If you're bilingual or trilingual, maybe even quadrilingual, we would love to have you join our online moderating team. To learn more, email us at office at calgarylifechurch.com. In seasons like the one that we're in right now, community is one of the most important things that we can have in our lives. And so we want to invite you to join a connect group. What is a connect group? Just simply a group of people connecting. <laughs> if you want more information on the different groups we have here at the church or how to join one, just jump onto calvarylifechurch.com slash connect groups. Here's how you can turn on personalized notifications for the CLC app. First, open up your settings, then under notifications, select CLC and allow notifications. Open up your CLC app, press on the little hamburger button in the upper left corner, select settings, notifications, and now you can pick and choose which notifications you'd like to see. This is the best way to stay up to date with what's most relevant to you here at CLC. To stay up to date with everything happening here at Calgary Life Church, make sure you follow us on social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, all of the good stuff. Make sure you follow us there. Download the Calgary Life Church app and visit us on our website, calgarylifechurch.com. Well, that's it for church news. Well, good morning, Calgary Life Church. It's an incredible honor to be with you guys today on this Valentine's Day. Uh, Judith and I love pastors Anthony and Madeline, and we're so grateful for their lives and their leadership, and we are truly honored to have them and you as a part of our Hillsong Leadership Network. And we loved having Anthony and Madeline in our home in Phoenix during the last Network Day. In fact, we had a lot of the team as well. Yeah, it just seems like it's been a long time ago. Miss you guys. That's right. By the way, I may need to confirm that I actually am Terry Christ. I popped on your website this morning and I saw that you have an old picture of us. It's actually only 10 months old, but it looks like it was 10 years ago. For me, not, not for Judith. It was what? It's a BC photo before COVID, actually before the quarantine beard took over my face. By the way, your pastor has an epic beard going and he has a little more black hair in his than I do because he's holding on to his youth well. Hey, since it's Valentine's Day, we're gonna talk about relationships and specifically how to resolve conflict in our relationships. Maybe this is completely irrelevant in Canada in fact, if you have any conflict in Canada, it may be because it bubbled up from the USA. I really feel like we should go on a world apology tour for yeah. everything happening in America. But the truth is, we all have conflict. We have conflict from time to time, 
even when we don't want to acknowledge it. We can call it a healthy disagreement, a marital dispute, or even intense Christian fellowship, but I'm just gonna call it what it is. It's impossible to go the distance and to be emotionally present in any kind of relationship without some conflict along the way. We all deal with this, and especially during these times of fear and anxiety and uncertainty, and being closely confined to one another for months and months and months. Yeah, I think conflict is always most devastating with our closest relationships, especially within a family, a biological family, a church family, even a family of close-knit friends. Our families, our relationships were designed by God to be safe places where we can retreat from the pressures of the world and recharge. But what happens when there's strife in your family or with your friends? What happens when the security of our homes are breached with anger, with strife, with bitterness, with contention? What then? What do we do when we just can't leave it all at the office or at the classroom? Even more, what do you do when there's conflict in your marriage? Someone once compared the male-female relationship to two cor porcupines. Porcupines. Not porcupines. <laughs> porcupines trying to survive in a cold winter. When the temperature drops and the snow begins to fly, they cuddle together for warmth. Mm, so beautiful. Yeah. But when they do, their quills prick each other, so Ouch. they are pulled apart, but soon begin to shiver again, so they move closer together and stick each other again. So the dance goes on, damaging and distancing, damaging and distancing, until they realize that if they don't learn to adjust to one another, they'll never survive. That's quite the great description of relationships and marriages. We have to learn to adjust to one another. Dr. John Gottman, one of the top marriage therapists in the USA, uh, published a fascinating study on his study of thousands of couples in disagreement. Dr. Gottman says that he can watch a couple argue for just five minutes and determine with 91% accuracy wow. whether that couple will remain together or divorce. His research makes the argument that relational health is not based on whether you fight, but on how you fight. So let us settle four things today that we can all benefit from affirming before we go any further into the teaching. First, conflict is normal. Just want you to settle that today. You're not abnormal, you're not unusual, and it's not just you and the people you're engaged with. Number two, conflict is unavoidable. Number three, conflict is always an opportunity for personal and spiritual growth. And number four, conflict can be handled in a way that is helpful or harmful. All couples fight, but healthy couples fight fair. All families experience conflict, but healthy families have learned to process it well, effectively. Now, with those big ideas in place, we want to break this down into two areas. First of all, let's look at what creates conflict in our relationships. I mean, what really creates it? And then, second, let's look at how to resolve conflict in such a way that we grow through it and become better people because of it. We're going to anchor this, by the way, in James chapter 4. It's a pretty heavy and sobering passage. And I want to call the message Fight Club because I got to name it and Judith didn't. True. James chapter 4 has a lot to teach us. James 4, 1 through 3. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want to get what you don't have, so you scheme to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. And you want only what will give you pleasure. So what creates conflict in our relationships? Well, the easy answer is to list the obvious reasons that usually are surface reasons. And the reasons are as broad as our emotions, our opinions, and our preferences in life. The obvious reason might look like money, parenting, in-laws, sex, power, authority, 
personal habits or even household responsibilities. But the issue is never the issue. The issue that you're visualizing or that you might seem, it might seem that is the prevalent issue is never the real problem because issues attract conflict the way that mountain climbing attracts lightning. True. <laughs> there has to be a bigger storm brewing for the issue to have anything to connect with. If we can decouple the issue from the real problem, we can usually diffuse it. And that's why there's always two layers to every single argument. The first layer is what we're arguing about, and the second layer is what the argument is really about. And rarely are they ever the same. Hey, have you ever found yourself in the middle of an argument that just seems to come out of nowhere when you suddenly realize this is not what we're actually arguing about. Isn't that a weird moment? It's like your eyes are suddenly open to another dimension. It's like you've discovered a hidden secret. The hair rises up on the back of your neck and you realize this has nothing to do with where I dropped my wet towel. I've missed her birthday again. So on the surface, it may seem like the conflict was over something said or done or the lack of something said or done, but there's always a much deeper level to the conflict. Now, we've discovered that the deeper level is usually attributable to one of the four things that James sweeps into this big, broad category of what he calls passions or selfish desires. I hope you're taking notes this morning. I want to encourage you to write this down. We always engage in conflict when we feel, first, our rights are being violated, or second, our needs are going unmet, or third, we have lost control over something, or fourth, we are simply afraid. Those four things are the basic anatomy of selfish desires. They're the basic anatomy of passions unrestrained. And as a result of that, they are the basis for conflict. And the one thing that is common to each one of those feelings is that they're internal issues. They're matters of the heart. In fact, if you only learn one thing today, I hope it's this. Most of our conflict is caused by internal issues, not external issues. We all want to blame the external event for the problem when it's the internal issue that needs to be resolved. And let's be honest, we all have internal issues, right? Come on, it feels good to come clean. Just say it with me. Say, I've got issues. I've got issues. Feels liberating. Let me tell you something that'll feel even better. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you've got issues. No, you actually don't have to do that. Researchers have been able to define two broad categories of external things that trigger anger and conflict. But in both cases, it's still the internal issue that needs to be addressed. The first category is the one that researchers commonly call stupid inanimate objects, like shoelaces that break at the worst times, or ATMs that eat your debit card, or toys or furniture in boxes marked easy, easy to, to assemble. assemble. You wait for an elevator and when it doesn't appear immediately, you push the button repeatedly on the theory that this stupid elevator will <laughs> then sense your urgency and bypass all the other people waiting on their floors. Uh, they don't matter. Yeah. You do. Yeah, usually. <laughs> uh, the second stimulus that triggers anger is also something that we have no control over, and that's other people. I'm glad you didn't say stupid people. Yeah. Other people. Other people. Uh, people who drive too slow or too fast. Right. People who tailgate too close. People who don't give you what you order at the drive through window. Now that's a pet peeve. <laughs> There's one fast food restaurant near my house that is so bad at getting my order right, I just pull up and tell them, give me whatever you want for me to eat today. <laughs> but actually, when it comes to people, it's so easy to blame our anger on them. Most of us consider the people or the inanimate objects as the cause of our anger. But the real truth is, the only one that really makes us mad is ourselves. Do you make you mad? Judith makes herself mad, and I make me mad. And, and I've had to face that illuminating truth. I, in fact, want to encourage you to face it. From time to time, I've just actually had to say, I make 
me mad. Maybe the next time you're really angry at someone, you should look them in the eye, maybe stick your finger out, turn it around and say, I make me mad. It's an internal issue. And if we can solve the internal issues, then we can rise above the external issues. And that's why I'm emphasizing this. Unresolved conflict is the result of the internal, not the external. Now, you may be wondering, well, Pastor Terry, what kind of internal issues? Once again, the feeling that our rights are being violated, our needs are going unmet, we have lost control, or we are afraid. Now, let's take a few minutes to unpack those issues because I think, again, those are the issues behind all issues. Those are the issues behind all issues. I want you to get that. First of all, we engage in conflict when we feel that our rights are being violated. For example, a teenager isn't allowed to participate in the things that his or her friends are doing. So they feel as if it's an injustice. They feel as if it isn't fair. Or a spouse comes home late from work for the third night in a row. A partner gets angry because they feel neglected. Or a partner makes a financial mistake and puts the entire financial stability of the family at risk. And on and on it could go. So it's always our desire to be respected, appreciated, esteemed, nurtured, and loved. All of the things that we look at as rights, when they're violated, we become angry and resentful. We feel dishonored, disrespected, unappreciated, and maybe even unloved. So we engage in conflict when we feel our rights are being violated. The second thing is we engage in conflict when we feel our needs are going unmet. Now, anytime we feel our needs are going unmet, it's because of two things, either unrealized expectations or unrealistic expectations. So let me highlight the difference between the two. Unrealized expectations are legitimate expectations that should be met in our relationships. As children, we expect to be loved, protected, cared for, affirmed, developed. And as spouses, we expect love, respect, faithfulness, and understanding. As a society, we expect civility, boundaries, safety, and security. And as a church, we expect to be a part of a healthy, life-giving community that does the journey of life together. And these are all legitimate expectations. And when those expectations are not met, we can become disappointed, disillusioned, angry, and even despair. On the other hand, some relationships break down because of unrealistic mm. expectations. Sure. If you feel resentful because you weren't raised in a home with three maids and a British butler, you probably need to adjust, even lower your expectations of a normal childhood. Some of us didn't go to Disneyland every year, and in spite of that, we are somewhat emotionally stable. Somewhat. Most days. <laughs> it's unrealistic to expect to be given right. everything you can dream up or that you can desire. But some of us are unhappy because we've set impossibly high standards for ourselves and even others in our life. We're suffering from exaggerated expectations and our unrealistic expectations are killing us. Instead of enjoying the people God has placed in our lives for who they are, we are chronically disappointed in who they are not. Yeah. I want to encourage you to increase your expectation as to what God wants to do for Come you on. and through you and decrease your expectation as to what other people are there for and what they should fulfill in your life. Reality is not your enemy. I want to say that again. Reality is not your enemy. It's your opportunity to put your trust in God and grow as a person. So good. We engage in conflict when we feel like our needs are going unmet. Love that idea, Judith. So we got to level up our expectation in God and maybe dial down looking to people as our source. Third, we engage in conflict when we feel a loss of control. And the fact is, this may affect guys more than it even does ladies. Because oftentimes we've been raised to see authority and control as signs of manhood, at least in the country below you. And when we face the loss of control, 
And, and we do that through life, it happens. We do it through aging. We, we can experience a prolonged illness or maybe a career change that was unanticipated or sometimes your family doesn't listen to you or people patronize you. And when those things happen, it feels like you've lost control. So we, we grow angry and resentful. And somehow we feel that if we're not being heard and obeyed, then we're not being valued and respected. Wow. In fact, this was a really difficult one for me as our children were emerging into adulthood because my tendency as a dad was to control them, not because I wanted my way for them, but because I felt like controlling them was my way of protecting them. So if I kept firm, rigid disciplines in place, I was gonna protect them from the world, protect them from themselves. I was gonna protect them from a lot of things in life. Well, that worked when they were young. And of course, we all do it as parents. We say, don't touch the stove. We say, get down off the roof. We say, you know, whatever it is, because we wanna protect them. So the control is a safeguard for their safety. And then as they grow, we release more freedoms to them. And then finally, you get to the point as they emerge into adulthood, where you just release all freedoms to them. And that wasn't easy because I still want to protect my kids. And now I'm, I want to protect their wives. I want to protect our grandkids. And I had to learn how to adjust control. We engage in conflict when we feel a loss of control. And fourth, we engage in conflict when we feel afraid. Yeah. Psychologists tell us that when we are afraid, it triggers the primal instinct, the amygdala, the of our brain, that in the instinct that clouds our thinking and problem solving skills and our creativity, and it triggers one of three responses when we are in our lower brain, the fight or flight or freeze syndrome. It's been referred to as the upstairs downstairs brain. And when we are trapped in the downstairs of our fearful brain, it's hard for us to see a way forward. And in that state, no amount of coaxing or yelling or pressure or explaining changes our response. Most of the time, it actually solidifies that fearful response. The answer to the fearful brain is pausing to focus on something that helps us to feel secure, to feel heard and valued. And in that moment, we need to pause, take a breath, change our tone, reassure ourselves and the other person that we're valued, and it lets us back into our upstairs brain where we can gain clarity and perspective in order to problem solve. So we engage in conflict when we feel afraid. I learned something from you. Of course, I've been learning something from you since the day I met you. Really? Hey, have you ever had someone jump out of some place unexpected and scare you? I mean, really scare you. What was the first thing that you did? Well, you probably beat the fool out of them. What happens when you thought one of your kids was hurt only to find out that they were playing a prank on you? You beat the fool out of them. Hopefully not, but you wanted to. The point we're making is that fear drives anger. Just think about the history of war and you'll see how that fear has driven conflict through the ages. So those four things, violated rights, unmet expectations, loss of control, and fear. Those four problems are the symptoms of a greater problem. The greater problem is of us not trusting God to take care for us, of us not trusting God to defend us, of us not trusting God to meet our emotional needs. And even fulfill us. I really believe that's the root of all conflict. Yeah. That's the primary source. Do I trust God to care for me even when others don't seem to be caring for me yeah. in a way that makes me feel cared for? Do I trust in the sufficiency of Jesus to provide me with what I truly need in life? So many times, conflict is a trust issue. Yeah. So let's offer a few thoughts, sweetheart, on how to resolve conflict through fighting fair. By the way, it's a strange idea, right? Yeah, it seems that way. Oxymoron. Fighting fair. It's like something you might say to your kids. You know, those illogical statements we say to our kids over the back seat in the car. Start fighting fair. I usually say like, play nice. Play nice. You say fight fair. Okay. What does it really mean? 
how do you even fight fair? Well, let me take you on a little journey for just a minute. Back before there were rules in boxing, a fighter could do anything he wanted in the ring. There was only one guiding principle. He could kick, he could gouge, he could elbow, he could headbutt, he could bite, he could hit below the belt. In fact, his only guiding principle was to win at any cost. It was bare knuckle brawling. And surprisingly, a lot of people got seriously hurt. Really? Yeah, and a few people actually died in the ring. So finally, in the late 1800s, some rules were established. Weight classes were defined and a referee was placed in the ring. And fight fans discovered something amazing. Fighting fair actually keeps boxers alive. Does that mean fighting fair can keep relationships alive? It can. <laughs> in our relationships, Fighting Fair helps us to resolve conflicts without hurting anyone. Fighting Fair helps us to grow through the conflict. Fighting Fair strengthens a relationship. Again, conflict is normal, normal. And if we handle it in an appropriate and responsible way, it matures us as people, as friends, as spouses, and just in our general relationships. This will even work in your office. So here's a few suggestions. First of all, attack the problem, not the person. In fact, Romans 12 verses 17 and 18 says, don't hit back, discover the beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even, that's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God, I'll take care of it. You know, Terry and I have been married for 38 years. Well done. <laughs> I'm the numbers guy. True. <laughs> I remember it. We resolve conflict more quickly when we acknowledge that the problem is our problem. Together. Together, yeah. right. It's not just his problem or my problem. And since we as a couple are committed to each other, this problem has to be resolved. Has to be. So the first step is really to identify the problem accurately, the underlying issues. We can identify it mutually and come to some agreement as to what the problem is. But we can't do that if we feel like the other person is our enemy or when we firmly believe, I mean really and deeply believe that the person is our enemy, there's no resolving this conflict. But when you really deeply believe that your spouse loves, values, and respects you, it's far easier to overlook even those small annoyances that really exist. <laughs> Let alone the bigger issues yeah. <laughs> that also exist oftentimes in relationships. That's true. The second thing is fix the problem, not the blame. You know, an amazing amount of energy is spent in times of conflict on blaming and excusing instead of seeking resolution. That's why Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 7 and verses 3. He said, why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? You actor, you hypocrite, you pretender, he says. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So fixing the problem means that I take responsibility for my part in the conflict and I focus on the solutions, not assign the blame. We all have to decide in moments of conflict, do we want a victory or do we want a relationship? Do we want to win or do we want resolution? Do we care about the scorecard or do we care about each other? It's a deal. Third, keep it private. Don't take it public. Now I'm not talking about living in a dangerous situation and keeping it hidden. And I'm certainly not talking about putting people on blast where you tell everybody. So be careful who you entrust with your conflicts. Wise counsel is important, but keep it private. That's where the Holy Spirit can be at work. First Peter four verse eight says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love conquers a multitude of sins. 
Love doesn't ignore them, it addresses and covers them. This is probably a bigger issue than ever because of social media that's given us the platform to escalate conflict with 140 characters followed by the send button. It makes it easier to air the matter before a wider audience than ever. Then there's a legitimate place for uh, other people to weigh in and to contaminate the process of problem solving. But there is also a legitimate place in your life for seeking wise spiritual counsel. It's very different than enlisting allies among family and friends. When we draw others into the problem, the tendency is for a win and loss mindset to develop. And as other choose sides in your life, it's harder for you to make a good decision going forward. Fourth, choose your timing, but address it ASAP. Ephesians 4 and verse 26 says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, for Judith and me, this became one of the most important lessons we had to learn. And it's something that we have to diligently practice. We do everything we can to avoid going to bed angry, even if it means staying up for three days in a row. <laughs> you know, I've discovered that if you go to bed angry, you only get angrier in the night. Going to bed angry leads to the cover wars. You know what that is, don't you? Tuck and roll. It's a, yeah, tuck and roll. It's amazing how the blanket shrinks when you're angry. On a normal night, the blanket is big enough to cover your bed, but when you're mad, it shrinks. And then you reduce yourself down to tucking it in and rolling it over, leaving the other person uncovered. I just always thought that was an accident. Now you're telling me it's on purpose? Whoops. <laughs> And then the retaliation is when her toe touches your leg. Yeah, the point is, if you go to bed angry, you usually wake up angrier. So the principle here from the scripture is to find the right timing. That may not literally be by nightfall. Sometimes people need to just kind of breathe, but the spirit of the principle is to address it before too much time has passed. Time doesn't resolve wounds. It creates distances. Healthy conversations at just the right time lead to resolutions in life. And fifth, never ever seek revenge. Anytime you seek vengeance, you forfeit justice. So seek truth, seek peace, seek resolution, seek forgiveness, seek restoration. Seek after justice, but leave vengeance in the hands of God. Romans 12, 17 through 20 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's really good. And those are some of the most challenging words I think yeah. that Jesus has given to us on how to find resolution yeah. in the midst of conflict. Yeah. But as challenging as it is, it works. So many times our failure to find resolution yeah. is because we're doing it our way not his way. And that leads me to sixth, pray it up before you bring it up. Yeah, Conflict really needs to be firmly placed in the context of love and prayer. Yeah. There's an amazing thing about prayer is prayer is the great clarifier. Yeah. It clarifies the issues. It opens our vision. Prayer purifies our motives. In fact, if you pray about it long enough and hard enough, you'll know the what, when, and how when it comes to addressing it. I've decided in my life, never take it to someone until you have first taken it to God. Now, I love what Pastor Bobby Houston says about prayer and about the challenges that we face in any area of life. She says, let prayer do the heavy lifting. That's good, isn't it? Let prayer do the heavy lifting. James wants us to know that God can be trusted with our hearts and our relationships. You know, we never have to fear God not being a good father. In fact, as hard as this may be to understand, God cares about your relationships even more than you do. 
And I know you care about your relationships and he wants them to flourish. Any relationship that doesn't have Jesus at the center of it is under-resourced. Jesus is the most important asset you can have in a relationship. He is your leader and your guide. His Word is your compass and your relational roadmap. His Spirit gives us the power to succeed and the grace to get back up when we fail. And we really only truly fail by not trusting in Him, by not relying in Him, by not inviting Him into the center of our relationships. Oh, I, I hope that Jesus is at the center. He's the unbiased counselor in every relationship. He's the master therapist. And even more, He heals us of our wounds instead of just teaching us how to cope. He is your safe space when the relationship is rocky. He's your spiritual Switzerland or Canada, definitely not the U.S. You know, we can be jerks and still find refuge in Him. We can be struggling and find healing in Him. Jesus is the arbiter of truth. And when He's at the center of a relationship, you have a moral absolute that both of you or all of you can build around. Jesus is the ultimate marriage ref. Hey, in closing today, have you invited Jesus into your relationships? Have you put him at the center of your life? If not, this is the moment to do exactly that. I really believe that God brought you to Calgary Life Church today, whether you're in person or online, in order to begin a relationship with you. And without Jesus being the focus of all of this, well, this is just a therapy session or a motivational speech. And while there's nothing wrong with that, those things are far less than what it can be with Jesus at the center of your life and at the center of what we've talked about today. I wanna to invite you, we want to invite you to begin a relationship with Jesus by putting your trust in Him. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 9 that if you believe in your heart that He is God's Son, sent to die for you and raised to life for you, that God will give you His salvation and that you today will become a brand new creation, a brand new person in relationship to who God is and the future He has prepared. I wonder, sweetheart, if you'd take just a moment to talk to our friends who may be watching today and to people we've never had the opportunity to connect with and to lead them in that prayer of making the decision to follow Jesus. I would just like for you to take a moment uh, to tune out every distraction, maybe close your eyes, definitely open your heart, and you can repeat this prayer after me as we go to God, knowing that He is the ultimate healer and rescue in our lives. Just say this, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I surrender to your vision for my life. I surrender to your vision for my life. I believe your plans are greater than any dreams I could have. I believe your plans are greater than any dreams I could have. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe Jesus is your son. He was sent to die for me. He was sent to die for me. He was raised to life for me. He was raised to life for me. So I put my trust in him. So I put my trust in him. And from this moment forward, from this moment forward, I will follow Jesus. I will follow Jesus for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. In his name I pray. In his name I pray. Amen. 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 Well done, you. You know, if we were in person with you, we'd be applauding right now. But I want you to know that the Bible says that the very angels in heaven throw a celebration when just one person comes to accept the Father's gift of salvation in and through Jesus. And so today there's a wild party taking place in heaven. On this Valentine's Day, you've come into relationship with God. And I know that as your service concludes today, we're praying for you, standing with you along with your pastors and your entire staff and team, believing that the rest of your life is gonna be the best of your life. And so with that we today, love we love you. Thanks for our time together. If you made the decision today to follow Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. So the next thing that we want you to do is jump onto the CLC website or CLC app 
and fill out a connect card. You'll see a little box on there that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. Check that off and one of us will reach out to you and help walk you through these next steps. We'd also like to send you one of these red bags right here. It's just got a couple different resources to help you out as you begin this walk with God, including a New Testament Bible, a little book called Why Jesus, and some teachings from Pastor Anthony. So make sure you do that. And again, we're so happy for you.